All right, yes, I think when Graham um, thought that he'd asked me, he didn't realise I'd actually moved back to the University of Melbourne. But then by, by the time he'd asked, it was too late to pull out. So uh, I'm glad to be the sole University of Melbourne uh, representative here today. So I would like to thank Graham for the invitation and look for putting this event together, which I think has um, been absolutely fantastic. So I wouldn't mind a round of applause to start off for Graham. So we're here to celebrate the great man, Claude Elwood Shannon, and I think we should start with a chant, because my job's a warm-up warm -up act for all of the other speakers. So, and what I like doing, especially when there are other lectures on nearby, is to be very loud and make everyone curious as, gee, they sound like they're having good fun. So on the count of three, what we want to do is a very loud, Shannon, Shannon, sh okay? No, Shannon, 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 Shannon. All right, beautiful, thank you very much. That should pick up in the mic nicely. Um, so I'll, I'll let you read through this. This is a quote from a, a, gray, a journalist, I think, wrote, writing for the Scientific American about what Shannon did, just to introduce it. But I've got to tell you, I love this man, Claude Elwood Shannon, so much that when I moved down from Sydney to Melbourne, the only suburb I was ever going to live in was Elwood, <laughs> which I did indeed do. And my, I have two dogs, their names are Claude and Shannon. So I don't know what else, you, you can see the impact that he's had on me. And uh, that's, a, I think, a nice quote in terms of uh, his contributions. Oh, better, better flick the right thing. Uh, so you might have seen this, this logo that the IT Society have put together, Claude Shannon, 1916 to 2016. If you ever thought about getting a tattoo but didn't know quite what to get, I think I've just found it for you. I challenge at least several of you, at least seven of you, to go and get that tattoo done. Uh, there's a tattoo parlour in Richmond that's giving me a special deal on this. Just go in and mention the secret word, code word, entropy, and you will get a very good price on that tattoo. Um, one reason, I don't know if you know, this, 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 so there's, there's Shannon in about 1973. And I was lucky enough to meet Shannon at a, at a conference at, um, at that time. And uh, <laughs> it, was, it was one of the greatest days of my life, or the greatest five minutes of my life, that uh, I was able to meet Claude there. So I am speaking from personal experience when I talk about his life. Shannon was born on April 30, 2016. So about a week ago, that was when the big uh, the, the official 100th birthday was. He was born in a small town of Potosky and, uh, to Claude Elwood and Mabel Wolf Shannon. But he grew up in the nearby town of Gaylord in Michigan. Now, if you do visit Gaylord, it's famous for two things. The ice tree and the big beer bottle. So they're slightly above Claude Shannon, but if you go to Gaylord, that's what you should check out. There's a photo of Claude um, just after he was born. It's, it's not really, it's just a random baby photo, but no. I'd, uh, don't let the truth get in the road of a good picture. So with, with, with thanks to, um, to Wikipedia, my extensive research that I've done, I discovered that Shannon's father, Claude, his name was also Claude, was a self-made businessman and judge, and his mother was a language teacher and the principal of the high school in Gaylord. Uh, most of Shannon's first 16 years was spent in Gaylord, and he attended public school there, graduating from Gaylord High in 1932, at the age of 16. He showed an inclination towards mechanical and electrical things, and his best subjects were science and maths. And at home, he constructed such devices as models of planes, a radio-controlled model boat, and a wireless telegraph system to a friend's house half a mile away from some old fence wiring that he, that he found. His childhood hero was Thomas Edison, hence the picture of Edison, and in fact he later discovered that they were distant cousins. Uh, I think it was his grandfather, in terms of his inventiveness and his curiosity, that had the biggest influence. He was a farmer and an inventor and is credited with inventing an automatic washing machine. So his grandfather, they think, was perhaps more of an influence on his, on his career than his parents. Um, if you do visit Gaylord and you're, you've already seen the ice tree and the big beer bottle, 
that you may want to go to Claude Shannon Park, which is at 126 West Main Street in Gaylord with a statue of Claude Shannon. They do actually recognise him as a, an important person from the past. So he, he went to the University of Michigan and he studied uh, electrical engineering and mathematics and was first introduced to the work of George Bull and that's going to come back and impact what he does a little bit later on. So he soon uh, began his graduate studies, but he, so he moved to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and he worked uh, on Vannevar Bush's differential analyzer, an early, early analog computer, and the photo shows Vannevar Bush with his differential analyzer. So he starts to work in this area of computing. And out of his master's thesis, came this paper, a Symbolic Analysis of Relay and Switching Circuits. The thesis has been called possibly the most important and also the most noted master's thesis of the century. I'm not going to give anything away because there's a talk on this immediately, immediately after my talk, other than to say there's a photo of George Bull and had something to do with George using the, uh, the results of George Bull and we'll, you'll find out more in a minute. His PhD thesis, he, uh, Vannevar Bush suggested that Shannon, emboldened by his master's thesis success, should work at the Cold Spring Harbour Laboratory in order to develop similar mathematical relationships for quantifying Mendelian ge genetics. The research resulted in Shannon's PhD thesis at MIT called an Algebra for Theoretical Genetics. That is the Cold Spring Harbour Laboratory. After I saw this photo, I immediately signed up for my second PhD because I thought it looked like not a bad place to be studying. There's going to be a talk on his PhD thesis a little bit later on as well. His first job, he got to go to the Institute of Advanced Studies at Princeton, where all these amazing uh, intellectual scientists and math mathematicians were based, and I'm sure it influenced his future career significantly. He, he met, he would have run into John von Neumann, Albert Einstein. Who's the third one? Gödel. Thank you for saying that. Looked like I was trying to be interactive, but I just forgot for a second. <laughs> so, uh, an amazing place to be. And uh, I just found this quote while I was doing it as well. You may have seen. Young man, in mathematics you don't understand things, you just get used to them. That always makes me feel a little bit better when I've got no idea what's going on <laughs> when I'm studying the mathematics. So Shannon then moved to Bell Labs and it was during the war and so he worked on fire control systems and cryptography. So fire control systems are trying to work out how you can do a better job of aiming and firing guns essentially. It was during the war so it's not surprising I guess that these were the sorts of things that he was working on. There's a photo of Alan Turing there because for two months early in 1943, he came into contact with leading British cryptoanalyst and mathematician Alan Turing, who was visiting Washington and Bell Labs at the time. Shannon and Turing met at tea time in the cafeteria. Turing showed Shannon his 1936 paper that defined what is now known as the universal Turing machine. This impressed Shannon as many of his ideas complemented his own. You'll hear a little bit about some of the contributions to cryptography that, uh, that Shannon made later on too. But this is perhaps the biggest uh, contribution that Shannon made, perhaps from a biased perspective of someone that does communications theory, but a mathematical theory of communication was produced in, in 1948 while Shannon was at Bell Labs. There are three or four talks on what this paper does coming up, but it essentially defined what information is. It asked the question, if I've got a source of information, what's the fundamental limit to how much I can compress it? How many bits do I need to represent that source? And that's called the information entropy. And then he got some amazing results that if I try and send information through a, a noisy channel, then if you do it in the right way, it's actually possible to do it without making any errors provided you communicate below a certain rate, which is now called the channel capacity. And you'll hear talks on all of those different aspects following this. Now, the work 
was later produced uh, in a book with Warren Weaver as a co-author. Do you notice any change from there to there? <laughs> What's changed in the title? The, the. A becomes the. So it didn't take long to realise, oh, maybe this work's not bad. We're going to call it the theory of communication. The mathematical theory of communication. Getting a little bit cocky by that stage. Um, so at Bell Lab, Shannon also met Betty, who would become his wife. And she was a numerical analyst, and they got married in 1949. So there's a photo of Betty and, and Shannon with a flame-throwing trumpet. <laughs> it was just one of the things that Shannon liked to dabble in. We'll hear a little more about that in a minute. So. In 1956, Shannon moved back to MIT to a faculty position to an endowed chair in the Research Laboratory of Electronics, and he stayed there until 1978 where, when he retired. And in some sense, I think he started to withdraw a little bit from, from what I've read. So he didn't, could have been hugely famous and a celebrity, but he didn't really like going around giving lectures and didn't really like that side of things, wasn't comfortable with fame. So actually became a little bit uh, reclusive, as I understand it, and, uh, and, and then, you know, ended up retiring in, in uh, 1978. Now, I've got a video here that summarises some of these things as well. I'm not convinced the audio is going to work, but uh, we'll, see, we'll see how we go. Whoop. It's about a four-minute four video. Uh, there are many, many 
civilizations out there, many of them far more advanced than we are. I didn't uh, think in the first stages that it was going to have a great deal of impact. I enjoyed working on this kind of a problem, as I have enjoyed working on many other problems, without any notion of financial or gain or gain in the sense of being famous. And I think, indeed, that most scientists are oriented that way. So as you've seen, um, outside his academic pursuits, Shannon was interested in juggling, in unicycling, and chess. Uh, and we'll, we'll hear or witness some of those things in what follows. He also invented many devices, including a Roman numeral computer called thro Throwback, juggling machines, and a flamethrowing trumpet that we saw a picture of earlier. One of his humorous devices we saw on the video was a box kept on his desk called the Ultimate Machine based on an idea by Marvin Minsky, otherwise featureless, the box processed a sing possessed a single switch on its side. When the switch was flipped, the lid of the box opened and a mechanical hand reached out, flipped off the switch, then retracted back inside the box, as we saw beautifully on the video. In addition, he built a device that could solve the Rubik's Cube puzzle. So we're going to hear about his magnetic mouse later today as well. You saw it on the video. He published a paper on computer chess entitled Programming a Computer for Playing Chess. And there's a talk on that as well. But what you might know is that I also had the opportunity to play Shannon in a game of chess. And <laughs> I did, uh, to be honest, it's a little bit embarrassing. I beat him convincingly. Um, but here's one that I don't think there's a talk on. It's uh, card counting. So Shannon and his wife, Betty, used to go on weekends to Las Vegas, as you would, with MIT mathematician Ed Thorpe and made very successful forays in blackjack using game theory type methods co-developed with fellow Bell Labs associate John Kelly, a physicist based on principles of information theory. His method, known as the high-low method, a level one count methodology, works by adding one, zero or minus one depending on the cards that appear. Shannon and Thorpe also invented a small concealable computer, first wearable tech, to help them calculate odds while gambling. They made a fortune as detailed in the book Fortune's Formula by William Poundstone and corroborated by the writings of Elwyn Burlicamp, Kelly's research assistant in 1960 and 62. Shannon and Thorpe also applied the same theory later known as the Kelly criterion to the stock market with even better results. Claude Shannon's card count techniques were explained in Bringing Down the House, the best-selling book published in 2003, and, uh, and the, the drama, the film, 21. So Shannon was, in fact, uh, involved in some of those things as well. So I like the way that he said he didn't do all this to, to make money. <laughs> um, I, we'll see about that. Shannon pops up in all sorts of places. I just noticed this article recently, which is perhaps a bit related to the talk later on about, um, about in entropy of English. So if you'll bear with me, uh, his, it was an article uh, published at that website there. Words like booby hoop, squibble and whiz tangle may not sound particularly scientific, but researchers at the University of Alberta believe they may have uncovered the mathematical logic behind what makes nonsense words like these so funny. Taking their concept a step further, they found that the same formula also applied to puns, wisecracks and jokes in general, and could therefore provide a basic framework for all forms of humour. Presenting their findings in the Journal of Memory and Language, the researchers based their theory on the musings of German philosopher Schopenhauer who in 1818 stated that the cause of laughter in every case is simply the sudden perception of the incongruity between a concept 
and the real objects which have been thought through in some relation. In other words, it's all to do with expectation violation, meaning that the humour of any situation relates to the degree to which it defies our expectations. Many jokes make use of this concept by revealing unexpected meanings or implications in the punchline. By way of example, the study author presents present the pun, when the clock is hungry, it goes back four seconds. <laughs> boom, boom. They suggest, they could have found a better one, they suggest that the funniness of this joke lies in the unexpected double meaning it contains. To mathematically quantify this effect, they borrowed the Shannon entropy equation, which was devised by American mathematician Claude Shannon in order to determine the improbability of events. The formula produces a high entropy value for unpredictable events and a lower entropy value for predictable events. Armed with this notion, the team decided to investigate the level of humour detected by 968 undergraduate students at the University of Alberta in a series of non-words. These non-words were given an entropy value based on the unlikeliness of their combinations of letters appearing in the English language, or non-wordness. <coughs> Using this, the researchers found that they were able to reliably predict that the most entropic words were rated as the funniest, suggesting that Shannon entropy may well be a key indicator of comedic value. So there you go. Who would have thought? Um, just another little example. The other day, in my role as Deputy Dean, I worry about the diversity of the student cohort and, you know, what's the mix and of international students, are they all from one country or not, because that might not be a good position to be in. And instead of describing percentages of all these different things, I wanted a number. I was thinking, I, there, there must be a, a diversity index. There must be just a way of measuring. And it occurred to me, well, I could use the entropy as a measure of diversity in my group. And I thought, hmm, that's pretty good. I then thought, that's a brilliant idea, I can claim it, and made the mistake of going to the internet and discovering this. You type in diversity measures, and this comes up. The Shannon Index has been a popular diversity index in the ecological literature, where it is also known as Shannon's Diversity Index, the Shannon Wiener Index, the Shannon Weaver Index, and the Shannon Entropy. Uh, so it's used essentially to measure diversities in populations. And so I wasn't the first person to come up with this brilliant idea, but I was very happy because in a meeting about recruiting students in the week of Shannon's birthday, I was able to introduce him into the conversation, which is the most important thing. All right, that's spooky music. And I, that I don't know how to stop. <laughs> oh, uh, why is that spooky music? Um, a sound channel. What on all earth has that got to do with what we've just been talking about? A sound channel. Sounds a bit like, all right, talking about noisy channels and getting things through. What about, has now undone all code? It's a bit like the things we've been talking about, cryptography, channel coding. Well, the top one is an anagram of Claude Shannon. The bottom one is an anagram of Claude Elwood Shannon. That is spooky. <laughs> I don't know. It was destined to happen, without doubt. And you know you've made it, ladies and gentlemen, when you get a Google Doodle, and hopefully now, if you didn't know Shannon before, some of the things happening in this Google Doodle will make a little more sense. So I think I'm right on my time limit. Um, thank you very much for your attention, and thanks for coming along today.